Hi, everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to talk with Shafia Monroe about the role of the traditional midwife. Welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Rebecca Decker, and I'm a nurse with my PhD and the founder of Evidence-Based Birth. Join me each week as we work together to get evidence-based information into the hands of families and professionals around the world. As a reminder, this information is not medical advice. See evbirth.com slash disclaimer for more details. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Decker, pronouns she, her, and I'll be your host for today's episode. Today, I'm so excited to present to you a replay of one of our most popular episodes on the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast, and that is an episode from the year 2020 with special guest Shafia Monroe. Before we get started with this replay, I wanted to let you know that this episode contains discussion of black infant and maternal mortality related to racism, the era of slavery and Jim Crow, and the racism that continues to affect people's lives today. Shafia Monroe gave us such an inspirational episode in 2020 that we wanted to bring it back for those of you who are new to evidence-based birth, or even to those of you who've listened to it before but need some new hope and renewal. Whenever I listen to Shafia's words, it fills me with a sense of renewal and awe for Black traditional midwives and for the tenacity of the human spirit. So join us today as we replay this episode and you go on a storytelling journey with Mama Shafia Monroe about spirituality and traditional midwives. Hi everyone, today I am thrilled to welcome Shafia Monroe to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. Shafia Monroe is a public health professional, a midwife, motivational speaker, founder of the International Center for Traditional Childbearing, or ICTC, which was the first U.S.-based Black midwives and doulas professional organization. Shafia is also an author, infant mortality prevention specialist, doula trainer, and president of Doula Ready LLC. Since 2002, she has trained thousands of people in doula trainings, with one-third of them going on to become midwives. In 2012, Shafia received her Master of Public Health from Walden University, and in 2014, she opened Shafia Monroe Consulting, a cultural competency training service. Shafia has received numerous awards for her work, including the Lifetime Achievement Award and the Midwife Hero Award. Shafia is also a wife, mother, and grandmother. Welcome, Shafia, to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. Thank you so much and so excited to be here this morning. Can you take us back to what inspired you or when you felt that call to become a midwife? I'd love to hear your story. Well, it is a very fun story. And, you know, I, I tell people I did not know what a midwife was. What I feel, I tell people, your calling, you can look back at your life and see what things may have prepared you to do what you do today. So with that, I would say for myself, I want to be a veterinarian. I was younger. When I was eight and nine, I had so many animals in my home, but mainly there were animals that were either had been rejected or I found in the street or someone gave to me and I would take care of them. Some were sick. I would feed them and, you know, call the veterinarian, try to get advice over the phone, even at nine, go to the library, literally and get books and look things up, try these things. I remember I had a puppy that was taken too soon from his mother and someone gave it to me. I remember reading about the clock. I got the clock. I wrapped it with a hot water bottle. I kept getting up every so many hours with the dropper, giving it warm milk, and that puppy still passed away. Of course, I was devastated. And my cousin, who was nine, she was an artist, so she would make a plaster Paris tombstone, and we would bury it in her backyard. And so what I feel that taught me earlier is about the importance of being able to be compassionate for things that needed help, and also the ability to get up at night, because of course, midwifery, getting up at night, birthing up at night, and looking at research of being able to research at a young age to find out what could I do to help this little puppy. So I did that for years, taking care of animals. I wanted to be a, a, a veterinarian, saw puppies born, watched little kittens get born. I just missed the horse at the stable giving birth to its colt or foal. So those things prepared me, not knowing it though. And then around 15 or 16, I'm born in Boston, Massachusetts, in this area called Roxbury. Back in the 70s, I learned about infant mortality. And so somehow, again, I'm researching and learned that Black babies in Roxbury had the highest rate of dying of any baby at that time on the East Coast, or maybe even the country. And I was just shocked because, first of all, I had no idea that babies died, any babies died. I mean, you don't grow up at the table Thanksgiving or Christmas or Kwanzaa, whatever your holiday is, discussing, oh, by the way, there's infant mortality this year. Like, I never heard 
that turn in my life. And so I was like totally shocked. And there's no one really to talk about this. I didn't know anyone to say like why a baby's dying and why a black baby's dying. So again, I did more research to find out why. And after I researched, I came across this term called the granny midwives. Never heard about granny midwives either, though my dad's from the South, been to Alabama all my life. I found out later I was sitting around granny midwives, didn't know it. And so I researched these midwives and I read about their work. I'm like, oh my God, I said, I want to be like them. They were like angels to me. These women that walked through the woods with their bags to go help pregnant women who rubbed them, who prayed over them, who sang to them, who would come back and get them out the bed and, and wrap their stomachs and talk to the father and wash the children. And I'm like, man, who are these women? I want to be like that. And so that was my journey at 16 to become and emulate what we call the great midwives back then. We have changed their name since then to the grand midwives, but they really, I feel, my husband said they embodied me. Like, like they like talk to me and I just want to teach about them, not about them, but how to act like them which is compassionate, loving, patient. They had great experiences. And there's some documentation where the women said when the, when the midwives came to them, black women during Jim Crow, during segregation, when things are so horrible in the South, that these women were their, their light, come to the house and said, that you're going to be okay and that you're beautiful. And this research, they taught them African birthing traditions and how to maintain the African culture that came from, that came on the ships. They brought enslaved Africans to this country who brought their traditions with them. And those traditions included, along with growing rice and being blacksmiths and, and educated, they also brought with them midwives and birthing practices. And that's something that we don't hear about. And that has been my journey to really elevate that information for the last 40 years and to put it into today's trainings. And so that inspired me to become a midwife it was quite the journey because now I want to be a midwife and know about these great midwives. I'm in Boston. Well, where are these black midwives? And I could not find any for several years. I had to really work to become a midwife. I finally did find some midwives from the South. They're from Alabama too. They helped teach me for a little while. I then became a certified nurse's aide at 18 at Boston City Hospital and was put on the postpartum floor for a year. So that was great being on the floor 11 to 7 shift, which means that there's not a lot of people, you know, in the public, there's not a lot of help. So the doctors and nurses really gave me a lot of good things to do that I normally would have not have done. And then because it's 11 to 7 shift, it's quiet. So I could go talk to the mothers at night, be awake. I would hear their stories, all kinds of stories. And from all over the world, they're from the Caribbean, they're from Puerto Rico, they're from Ireland, they were from the Congo, they were from Roxbury, they were from Georgia. And so it was just wonderful to talk to all these women at night, those who were awake breastfeeding, and they would just, you know, give me different stories. And I, I hold those stories today of what they experienced as women birthing and what postpartum meant to them just through storytelling. So I love to use storytelling as one of the best forms of education. That's amazing when you talk about how they were your angels and you felt that spiritual connection with the granny midwives. Yes. And I still do to this day. Hasn't ended. And I love your point too about storytelling. And there's actually research on this, that storytelling is more impactful at educating yes. people than sharing evidence or research. So can you talk to us about the years of serving as a midwife in the Boston area? So you educated yourself, you trained as a midwife. What was it like when you started practicing there? I believe that was in the 1970s, correct? It was. So I got married at 18 and was already aware of midwifery and home birth. And so at 21, I, I did become pregnant and I could not find any midwife to help me of any color, actually. And then I kept looking and I found a physician who did home birth. He was Jewish, Dr. Elia. God bless him. I still remember him. So yes, he came to my home and I had my first home birth. But then he told me when he came back for a visit a few weeks later, the home postpartum visit, that he had just helped another African-American woman close by have her baby at home. And so of course I said, oh, I must have her number. He gave me her number. I called her right away and she was excited because she wanted to practice midwifery in Roxbury or in Boston as well. And come to find out she's from Alabama and her mother was a traditional midwife and she learned under her mom. So she was a registered nurse and she had her mother's middle free skill. So we got together and we created uh, with our six week old babies. We both had boys. We created the first black middle free practice in Boston, Massachusetts 
in 1976, really. Yeah, that's when we started. And it was interesting, you know, because nobody really was talking about homebirth. Though we had the the middle free model coming back into the country, you know, through the, I call my pioneer white midwives, you know, the Elizabeth Davis or Ida Mae Gaskin and many others. And that was great. But there wasn't that movement was, I'm hearing it, I'm seeing it also involved with the Massachusetts Midwives Alliance at that time. And so everything spring up around the nation, but there's nothing really spring up for Black women in Boston or in Massachusetts. So we created that movement. And I want to say, Rebecca, it was really exciting that the community grabbed it immediately. Because you have to remember, most people on the East Coast around the nation, they migrated from the South to escape the Jim Crow or the horrible segregation and violence there. So most of them had a grandmother, at least, who remembered midwifery. And so it made it easy back then because, you know, it was just 50, 60 years since that movement of not having a midwife. So people remember, it's like, oh, that's great. I remember my mother, you know, having a midwife or me being born at home. But also, there's also a political movement, which was the Black Power Movement and the Civil Rights Movement. This is when we have Martin Luther King and Malcolm X's whole movement nationally telling African descent people to reclaim their culture and to stand up for human rights. And so I could we use the midwifery platform as our rights as Black women. This is our history that we are Black midwives. We're upholding what we did from Africa to today. And this is a way that we're going to re-empower ourselves and the home birth is a revolutionary act of self-determination. And people like, yes, yes, yes. So we want to be safe. We don't want to be in houses where we know that you know, systemic racism, getting our women poorly or taking our babies or whether the black father's not welcome. So the men particularly, like, yes, I want my baby born at home. We want you to come. So it was like amazing. We were so busy doing births and, you know, running free childbirth class at the local Jeremiah E. Burke cafeteria. And even to the point that we had the Masters of Public Health Department contact us. They were hearing what we were doing, offering us grant money so we could keep doing it and go into Boston City Hospital, tell them the top OB, the complaints we were hearing. And they're saying, well, fine, if you want to come during rotation at 6, thinking they might scare us away, we'll, we'll, you can talk. I said, at 6 o'clock? Not a problem. We'll be there. So it did work out. And we were able to finally find midwives from Pakistan, from Ghana, and from Morocco. And we created our first midwife school in Roxbury. I think that was 19... 81 maybe. And we actually trained and had a formal graduation of five women who became midwives throughout our program. It was called the Traditional Childbearing Midwife School. And we also did apprenticeship for another five. So I think we trained about probably 13 Black women who could practice in Roxbury. So I say that those are very good years. We had a ball. Mm. And was there licensure? Like how did these direct entry or traditional midwives how are they able to practice in the state of Massachusetts? Well, there's no licensorship in Massachusetts still today. So oh, wow. we, call it, we call it the gray state. And also there was no CPM at that time. It was The word then was direct entry or lay midwife. You know, that the CPM had not been formalized yet. So we were working within the legal status of Massachusetts. You could do births. So we did them. So you didn't have to have a license to be able to do births? No, 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 no licensorship. In Massachusetts to mm-hmm. be a midwife. Okay. And you said those were those were kind of golden years for you all because there was this movement and there was a lot of power. Do you still keep in touch with midwives in Boston today? You know, most have moved out. So Boston's really hurting right now. There's only one African-American midwife who just got through going to the school in Maine who's now a CPM. And so during my time being there, I left Boston and moved to Oregon in 1991. And so I was active up until that time. So weren't other midwives. And so they have moved on or they're not doing it. So it's a dry place for finding a black midwife. We just have one. We have some, we have doulas, many doulas, but not midwives who are doing home birth. So I keep in touch with the ones who I knew who are now, like I said, again, living around the world. And the one that trained with me, Majid Ahmedadeen, who we ran the program together. We're still very good friends. Talk to her all the time. She's in Alabama, which by the way, just opened up midwifery legally, May 2018. So they they re-legalized licensed midwives again in Alabama. So that's good. That is my my spiritual home state. Yeah. So it sounds like 30 years later, Boston's really hurting for the Black community not being able to find Black midwifery care. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 
Can you talk a little bit about the spiritual role of a traditional midwife? I would say that I can. So tradition means itself information really passed on by word of mouth. That's what tradition means. You, when you're teaching traditionally, it's it's oral tradition. You're showing people, you're inspiring people. And what I read about the grand midwives, that most of them, they in fact, they said in the South, that if you weren't spiritual, if you didn't believe in a creator or God, literally, you couldn't be a midwife because people from Africa, very spiritual people, regardless of what they believe in, they believe in all different, you know, whether it's Yoruba, Christianity, Islam, or different types of things I don't even know about. They all have believe in a higher power. They brought that belief to the United States of America. And so the black midwives in the South during the 19, 1913, 1900, would say that they would have a dream where, I remember one story where the midwife said she fainted in the field. Maybe it was too hot. Maybe she was dehydrated, but she fainted. And she dreamt that she was delivering a white calf. And then later she became a midwife. Or... They were appointed where Miss Smith, Miss Charles Smith, listen to me good, like the Alabama midwife, written by her and Janet Linda Holmes, said that she would go sit with her cousin at 13 years old until the midwife came. And by the time the midwife got there, because again, these distance of having to walk, not having transportation, the babies would be born. And after the ninth baby, Miss Anderson said to her, you need to come with me and become a midwife. So we have the tradition of being spiritual where the creator called you or there's some kind of spiritual work or another person who's a qualified midwife says that she feels that you are meant to be a midwife. And then, and then also they believe that, you know, they would use the Bible. They would say, well, the Jewish community, the, the migration of enslavement out of Egypt, they paralleled to the enslavement of African-Americans and being freed. And so they saw the spiritual connotation of Moses, that baby being put in the water, you know, for freedom. And so they connect a lot of different things around being a spiritual midwife. And also they believe that, you know, you could pray with a difficult birth and have the creator give you the message. And they would say all the time, I didn't know what was going to happen. This baby was, you know, upside down. This was happening. I just prayed and prayed and I just knew the Lord was going to tell me what to do. And sure enough, I did this. The baby was fine. There's so many testimonials to that. And in fact, I just got through myself interviewing a midwife a few weeks ago, Um Salama. She's 70. And her talk is, I pray those babies out. And she's like, sure enough, I use prayer to this day. We had like a small group of black midwives from age 60 to 73 saying how they use prayer to get the baby out. So we might call it intuition or mother wit. We give a different name so that calling, but for us, it means spirituality, that you feel inside this other voice that's going to tell you what to do to help this mother. And also, it makes you become fearless, where you're not afraid, that you trust the process that God is going to talk to you, the Creator is going to talk to you, whatever your spiritual belief is, you're going to get the message of what to do. So there's a lot less fear involved when you go to the birth, because you feel like you're guided, you feel like you're divinely guided, you're protected, that you were called to this work. Someone's making this work anyway. You didn't want to be a midwife. It just, it came to you. So whatever brought it to you is going to make you successful. It doesn't mean that you don't use your common sense, but there's not this like, you know, what's going to happen. It's like, I trust that the creator has been this place and I'm going to know what to do. But more importantly, I know this birth is going to be fine anyways. I'm not even anticipating a problem because I know that the creator is creating this healthy situation. The baby's going to be fine. The mother's going to be fine. And it's going to be okay. So all that kind of terrestrial, celestial prayer is in the air, in your body. Many midwives pray before they leave. They bring their Bible, their Quran, their beads, whatever they bring with them, their spiritual book. They bring it with them in their bag and they pray before they get there. The person may not know they're praying, but they pray when they get there. They pray in the house. They pray over the person. Now, again, if you have the same culture, again, talking about the black midwives where it's the exact same belief system, they were Christian at that time, they would go in the house, you know, praying, you know, whatever that prayer was, you know, dear God, hallelujah, you know, help this house, help this mother. We're praying for safety. They would do that out loud and the family members would pray along with them because that was their cultural belief. So today, of course, we don't do that. We're helping a diverse group of families. I just got through helping a family for a home birth the other day, and they are black Hebrews. So they believe very different than a black Christian, or I helped an African-American Muslim or an African-American Baha'i 
or African-American person who's just spiritual. So you have to be very sensitive. But what's great about all these different groups I've mentioned, the common thread is that they believe in a higher power. They're, they're spiritual beings. They appreciate the fact that as a midwife, that you believe in prayer and that you will pray with them, whatever their prayer might be. So I think that's the piece about the spirituality that really drew me into when I read about these women, that they believed in a higher power. They trusted that they were being divinely guided by a power outside of them, that they were going to be okay and that they were, you know, they were working for the for God. They say, you know, my work is for the creator. I'm doing these births. I'm walking these through these woods. I'm being paid minimal money. But this is what God wants me to do. And so therefore, I'm going to do it. And so that just really, I admire that so much that they worked the way they did because they believed it was the right thing to do. And they saved so many lives and so many women and families thank them to this day. You know, when you talk to these women who are 80, they remember their midwives. And it's like, yeah, she was just amazing. Yeah, it's amazing to think of all of the, the children who've grown up and the generations that wouldn't be here if it weren't for the Black Granny Midwives. So when you're talking about the spiritual role and you're talking about the self-talk and the prayer, it made me think that the atmosphere in the room, like you said, it's not one of fear, but of one of faith and trust and belief. And it seems to be really different than what you see in medical institutional complexes or hospitals. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what your experiences are when you've been to hospital births and kind of the difference in that spiritual atmosphere. Thank you. That's an interesting observation, and I think we all can easily see it. If you go to a religious institution, whether it's a church, synagogue, mosque, temple, people's home, there's an energy that's emitted by the artifact that they put in and also how they live their life. We've all been to homes like, oh, my God, it's so peaceful here. Like, what do you do? Who are you? You can feel peace in some houses. Oh, we meditate here. Or this is our shrine area, the Hindu. And so when you go to the hospital, it's the complete opposite because it's built on a scientific man model. And it's not warm and friendly. And there is no spirituality. It's about fear and machines and speed. Let's hurry up. Let's get this done. Don't bring that foolishness into this room. We're going to do this. And so it is very different. You know, what I do try to tell families, though, though the hospital looks and believes that, that the family has the right to bring their belief or their cultural belief with them. And as we know, we're telling families now through their birth plan or through their midwife who might support it or their doula, but mainly the family, you know, create your birth room. You know, if you have something that makes you remind you of, of your spirituality that's going to bring that energy to the room, then bring that, whatever artifacts those may be. And people bring crystals, they bring their crosses. Again, they bring certain pictures or whatever they allow to bring to try to create that atmosphere to maintain their spiritual belief. People bring their podcasts, they have their, their mantras on them or, you know, their chants on them. So people nowadays are bringing particularly where I'm at, I'm in Oregon, where it's such a supportive state around birth, hospital and home. So no one tells you that you can't do anything in your room in Oregon. So I hear other stories across the nation where it's not friendly, it's not easy, there's a lot more hostility. But here, people can create that atmosphere to the best of their ability. But it's not that the, the doctor may not have it, though, when they walk in. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the difference. And when the midwives who I work with and the way that I train and was trained, you use the spirituality, they walk in, we walk in with a spiritual belief that you're divinely guided, you're truly blessed, you're living your success right now. We only expect the best for you. You know, you, God is with you. The creator's with you. You know, you're going to be okay. You're, you're that glowing entity right now. You know, the angels surround you. And so... That, so we're able to say that to the families that we serve with their permission. Because when we work with families, they, they, as a rule, know where we're coming from. When you look at your midwife's portfolio on her website or interview, you know that she's a spiritual midwife. And that's why they call me. That's why they call the women that I work with. That's why the midwives that I work with who think this way, this is why we're sought after. They want a spiritual midwife who's going to come in and talk a certain way, will respect their belief system, will engage in their belief system with them but mainly bring that energy with them. And so I, don't, I can't imagine not being a spiritual midwife. You're not, and, and that's the tradition. The tradition, even look at other groups you know, around the world, whether you know, the indigenous midwives of the United States, indigenous midwives of South America, or Asian midwives out of parts of Asia, 
India, I, I love doing anthropology and doing research. That's one of my hobbies on the side, exploring these different pieces around spiritual inquiry internationally. And it brings the work that I do cultural, my cultural competency training. I have to understand this. And all of the women, midwives, regardless of race, were spiritual people. Even out of Europe, before the witch birding, all those things that happened, even the midwives of Europe, they were spiritual women too. They believed in something and they brought those beliefs to the work that they did. And because of the patriarchal system in Europe that we called them witches and all these negative names and pushed them underground, it got lost sooner in Europe as opposed to parts of Africa. And again, bringing our tradition from Africa into the United States as enslaved people, you know, it was so important for us to hold our spirituality around birth because that's of all the things that they took from African descent people in this country, they took our language, they took our religion, they they took our children. They took everything, our clothes, our music. They took everything. What they did not take or could not take is how we birthed an African-centered way, our tradition. Because as a rule, when Black women on the plantation birthed, there was nobody there because nobody cared. You know, So normally who helped these women were other Black women who often, by the way, fact, were midwives from Africa. And if it's second generation, even the midwives who came from Africa, they taught their daughters how to be midwives. They passed the information down. That's tradition passed on to daughter, to daughter, to daughter. And so for many, many years, until we had the Shepherd Towner Act that eradicated the black midwife from the South in the 1920s, up until then, we were able to practice those traditions. Now, a lot of women don't remember it or they didn't know what it was, but I know what it was. The fact that black women only could stand up to birth, the tradition was they could not lay on their back. They had to either kneel, was the tradition, or they always had a a quilt on the ground. They would kneel on the quilt or squat to give birth. They always had physical contact. The midwives always rubbed mothers, very hands-on. They would use all kinds of oils, just like we would see in Africa, coconut oil, a palm oil, a sesame oil. They always massaged the moms. They always hugged the mothers. They always talked to them like they were little babies. Oh, come on, baby, you're going to do okay. Come on, honey. Always soft, nice, talk to them. Never mean. They would really dole over them. They always made the father, you know, feel empowered and included. You know, he had his job to do. He was he was valued. They were very much equitable in the sexes. One was not better than the other. They believed in male-female power. This is all the spiritual aspect of you know, I would call, I'm going to say for me, black midwifery, the tradition of black midwifery. It's not so much wearing a head wrap on your head or wearing African attire. It's more of the spiritual component. You really can't see. You have to be involved in it. You have to, and then you have to learn about it. And then when you learn about it, you see that, oh, my grandma did the same thing. When I fell as a child, she would talk like a baby, pick me up, put some oil and salve on my sore and tell me I'm going to be okay. And she would pray on that sore and blow on that sore. We call it the blowing of uh, spiritual energy on the pregnant woman's stomach. And so, yeah, I just love it. It's just so easy and such so, it's so natural and it's so universal and it works. It's amazing listening to you talk about it. It gives me chills and just thinking too to the contrast and how that was taken away from so many people, you know, like you said, with the criminalization of midwifery. And and I, I love that you're bringing this back. And I wish that we knew that more people who work in medical institutions were even aware that this kind of, the spiritual role exists. You know, just, just also just want to add, it, I see with this country, United States, that, you know, this, we've gotten more and more detached, even as midwives, because the term that we have to say now is that inappropriate touch, that we've heard that, said, I think it started like maybe 10 years ago, everything was called inappropriate touch, it's inappropriate, it was, everything was inappropriate, so now most mothers don't get touched, and like how can you birth a baby if you're not being touched? When I touch you, we believe that I'm passing good energy into you. I could also pass bad energy into you. So we say, you know, you don't want negative people around you. That was a tradition too around spirituality, that the mother had to be around pretty things and nice people for a nice birth and a nice baby. So if there's fighting in the house, arguing, they would say, oh, that's bad energy. Don't go around that person. So my point is that, you know, you go to the, and, and really quick too. So I have seven babies, most of them born at home, but I will always go to the hospital for my prenatal care as a midwife, because I wanted to see how they treated me. And I would never tell them who I was. I would just go there and, you know, like a regular mom, I stay on the scale, pee in the cup. And I remember the doctor 
We had this joke the whole time, me and the doctor. It was a joke on my part. She said, well, how are you feeling? I said, well, you know, I'm feeling great, but my back is killing me. I would love a backache. She never gave me a backache for nine months. You mean a back rub? Thank you, back (laughs) rub. Thank you. She didn't (laughs) touch your back, I I would assume. No, but she asked me, how are you doing? I said, well, my back is hurting. I said, I would love a back rub. And she would not give it. And I'm like, wow. And here I am. I'm a practicing midwife. You say to the mom, how are you feeling? You know what she's going to say. In fact, I would say to her, pregnant, how's your back? Oh, my God, it's killing me. Hey, lay down. Let me give you a back rub. And, oh, my God, I feel so great, Mama Shafir. This is amazing. Thank you. And that was what the, the black midwives did. You did not leave. You did not see a mom without touching her. The prenatal care is about the prayer and the physical contact. That is a prenatal care. We know now that, and I'm sure you might know too, Rebecca, from your evidence that we massage people, it lowers their blood pressure. It slows their breathing. It makes their whole respiratory system get into a good state. It creates their homeostatic state. That healing so, touch. It, it really exactly. is healing. Yeah, exactly. it's therapeutic. And so we're not healing our moms because when you go to prenatal care normally, there's no hug, there's no rub. It's just pee in the cup, get on the scale. Okay, you're doing good. Let's get that outside. Yep, the baby's moving. It's a boy. See you next week. It reminds me of a nurse midwife who told me how they got written up by hospital staff for rubbing a mom's back without gloves on. Wow. And without just that, on. yeah, like you you can't touch someone. And obviously things are different in the time of COVID, but this was before COVID. Right. And yeah, that just lack of physical touch. Well, but I see also when we talk about the American system around birth, it's less and less. I mean, I remember reading the book, Spiritual Manufacturing. The term was spiritual around birth. And now I don't hear that. We're using physiological, which means just let the mother alone, let her do what she wants to do. But that's not everyone's culture. Just, you know, don't touch her. Just let her do her thing. She knows what to do. We know that the body knows what to do, but we're mammals. And I always do the example of the whales or the dolphins. They run in flocks. Females tend to be together and they touch each other. And we see the dolphin giving birth in the ocean with the midwife dolphin helping and one helping out, same with the whale and the same with the elephant. There's a certain amount of physical contact. And even beyond that, as humans, we need that. So I think the physiological birth movement and this this thing about Kakma obstetric violence and the abuse that we're hearing, everything has become very negative around birth. The social movement, not that we want to be abused in childhood, there's a way for it, but I want to hear something loving, like, you know, loving birth and loving touch and let's get back to spiritual birth and spiritual midwifery. And let's get back to hugging our moms. And and mothers even want to be touched. I think we're being programmed that, you know, don't touch my stomach. You know, don't touch me. And I've, I've been reading a lot of things on Facebook. So that's interesting that people don't want to be touched. Where I want someone to touch. When I was pregnant, like, yeah, rub my stomach. You know, I don't care who you are. <laughs> my back hurts. <laughs> yeah, we so probably anyways. have a whole conversation about touching touching people's. <laughs> well, I think because so much, you know, so many violations have happened, I think. Exactly. maybe that's, So now everything was inappropriate, but now it's, it's on that everyone's afraid to touch because now- We have a lot I'm of collective like, trauma, I think, from abusive touch. Right. Yeah. But then we get to the point that if I did want to touch you as a provider, I'm afraid because now you might call it inappropriate and I'm going to get sued. You know, my hand yeah. touched, my hand, t- I meant to rub her stomach, my hand touched her breast, I touched her buttocks. Was that inappropriate touch with so instead, I just won't touch her because I don't take any chances. So we're losing something in the process of what I'm trying to say. I think we're losing something as we go this road. We have to be careful. Yes, we want to fight for rights, but we don't want to lose what we know is normal and healthy and spiritual. What inspired you to start doing doula trainings in Oregon? Let's see. Well, I want to say that the way that I was raised, I tell people proudly, I am a product of the 60s. So People have to understand the history of this country when we talk about the civil rights movement and particularly for African-Americans being freed in the you know late 1800s and then a continued 300 years of oppression after that. And so by the time we got to 1955, we have Dr. Martin Luther King and others in the South fighting for the right to sit, to go have lunch any place they want. So I grew up on the East Coast seeing that on the news and the whole country was on fire with social justice around Black lives. So Black Lives Matter is a new slogan, but it's an old slogan. We've been saying Black Power, Black Lives Matter from the 50s straight forward. And also my father from the South. So what I'm trying to say, I grew up wanting to be, understand that it's important for me to be a leader, that you had to go into your community and make change because there was 
discrimination happening across the nation. It doesn't matter where you're from. So I'm in Roxbury, and that's why I got involved with birth, seeing that more Black babies were dying. And I questioned Harvard and Boston University and Beth Israel. You know, we are the mecca of education in my state, but yet we have the worst birth outcome and no Black midwives. So, so what are you doing? Why are you the best Harvard and Boston City Hospital? And we came and saved Black lives. So in Oregon... I don't see, when I hear the word doula come up and I look up that word and see that it means enslaved woman, you know, a Greek enslaved woman. Of course, I can relate to African-American women being enslaved and doing free doula work for the people who oppress them. I don't say the owners, but the plantation people, the, the white mistress, she was served by black women all the time as a doula. That wasn't the word. That black woman went to her house and the big house, we'll call it, and, and wiped her face and emptied her bucket and changed her sheets and gave her the exact same soothing talk that she gave the same Black woman on the, on the plantation as enslavement because Black women don't change. So if they treat the Black woman well in birth, they're going to treat the white woman well in birth because that's just the way that we are. We're going to be fair. And so she got that loving care for free. And she breastfed her baby, maybe, and took care of her, did all the postpartum work. So we already had that history of doula. So when I heard that, I said, hey, what the heck? We've been doing that forever in this country, domestic workers. So we've done it historically, and we never got recognition. So I say that the first doula in America was African-American women. We doulaed every single white woman in this nation for free, for years, for decades. And then we did it as domestics. We were totally underpaid when we did it. And so we know this work very easily. So I wanted to create a training that would give that history for Black women that this is nothing new, you all. We've been doing this. We called it the Black Mammy, the domestic worker, you know, the enslaved woman. We are, we have the grand midwife. Those are the words that we use when we say doula. But I also wanted to create a system that would also empower Black women to take this on with a public health component and a program that would increase the number of Black midwives. And so our doula program is built on the foundation of the 20th century African-American midwife. So we open up with the black midwife prayer. They had a prayer, our heavenly father, the author and finish of our lives. We give thee thanks for health and strength and all the joys of life. We ask that thou would bless the mothers and fathers everywhere, make them more Christ-like and more loving in the things they say and do. Guide us in this meeting and may it be the means of preparing midwives to render service more pleasing to thee and more acceptable to our fellow man. And when our work on earth is done, Grant us the house of no made hands eternal in the heaven in the Lord's name. Amen. So that is the prayer of the Mississippi midwives in the early 1920s. And so we opened up with that prayer and I formed the dual training in 2002. So we're going on 18 years now. So for 18 years, I've been training these women with that prayer. And we have trained close to 3000 women now, I want to say of those women, I would say 85 or 91 percent have been African-American, probably 3 percent white American, uh, 1 percent Asian, 1 percent Native American. And then we have the other percent, them leaving out my map, I would say a multiracial, you know, different races, biracial, multiracial. So, yes, it's been a great training. And one third have gone on to become midwives and we train Everything we're talking about on this talk is what they're trained, the spirituality, the tradition, what the herbs are, the castor oil. So it's like going back in time, training of what we would have trained with our grand midwives. And then at the same time, they have evidence-based information. Why are more black babies dying in America? You know, what's the problem? You know, the leading cause for black babies in front health is low birth weight. Low birth weight comes from what? Prematurity. Prematurity comes from what? From stress. Stress comes from systemic racism, implicit bias, having food deserts, you know, going to work as the only black judge and having to fight all day long while you're pregnant and then going home at seven months having an early baby because you've had the consistent everyday harassment of being a black judge or a black doctor or a black midwife or a black teacher, you know, teaching black women and the people in that training that it's not young teenage girls on public assistance losing their babies, it's highly educated black women who are in mainstream white America having to fight to be seen and to be heard while they're pregnant, which triggers too much cortisol, and then the baby comes out. What can we do to prevent that? We can tell her to leave her job early at seven months. We can go every time we see her, make sure we give her plenty of massage and, and do talk therapy, which means that 
this is so hard, my job doing this. I hear what you're saying. I validate. You're not imagining that did happen. Do you want to write a letter to the Supreme Court? Do you want to write a letter to the president of the hospital to make a complaint? You know, what can we do to help get this energy out of you so that you can keep your baby in? And so those are things that we work on. How do we work in our community and, and go to, to outreach, go talk to young men, you know, on the corner, hang out and say, hey, do you have any children? Which we do. Oh, yeah, I have a baby. I just had a baby born the other day. I was in, in Virginia. And is your wife or girlfriend breastfeeding? No, no she can't because she has mental health issues. You know, and you're like, well, wow, is anybody helping her? No. Well, do you want some numbers? I would love some numbers. Like, and, you know, they say thanks for talking to us because nobody does. Like, it brings tears to my eyes. Just walking through the community, talking to our people with respect that we care. And we want to ask you, how can we help? And so that's how we train our, our doulas to be on the ground, revolutionaries going into the communities, asking questions, being humble, you know, smiling, you know, showing love, people, and then giving resources. And then, of course, well, my girlfriend had a baby, but my cousin's pregnant. I want your number. She needs to have you. And so it's just been a great experience. So it's it's a four-day intensive training, and, and also it's called the Full Circle Doula. So they come out, a labor doula, and a postpartum do all in four days. So pregnancy, labor, birth, postpartum, of course, breastfeeding, also inclusion of the family. So it's just, it's so much that they learn. It's And then they have two years to be certified once they get through with the four-week training. We have our own book list that's written by and about Black midwives or Black healers only. So what's it called? Medical apartheid or Killing the Black Body, books that no other doula training makes that people read mainstream. That's not even included in their readings. They're reading nice books. But no, we got to read the other stuff to understand why are the health inequities, not health disparities, because it's not about we don't know. It's inequity. It's purposely designed that we don't care. We're not going to give you equal treatment. So even the terminology that we use, you know, not calling somebody at risk. You're not at risk because you're Black, though they say you are. And you're automatically offered an aspirin because that's what's supposed to prevent your mature mortality. But the issue is not about taking an aspirin. The issue is about creating a system where women aren't being stressed out for getting hypertension because it, the care is so racist. Or it's about listen to black women. I don't feel right. I've been having a headache for five days. You know, I'm getting dizzy spells. My back is hurting. I'm seeing spots in front of my eyes. Oh, that's just stress go back home. And we hear about her being found dead on her on the floor. So it's those kind of issues, teaching our doulas how to have your clients don't take no for an answer. I'm not leaving this hospital until I get a second opinion. I want to be admitted. You know, that's kind of empowering. So it's just a great training. And it's amazing to think, you know, with 3,000 people having taken that training, then the many of them going on to become midwives and just the ripple effect of how many families they're touching. And I think of Nicole Deggins is one of your trainees and she is. Yeah. And the the work that she's done. And then recently we interviewed on the podcast, Isis Rose, who was a trainee of Nicole. And, right. you know, it's just amazing how, how Chanel many people. Portia, are, yeah. You know, ancient song, Claudia Booker. We trained. I was, so we were the first, that's what I'm saying. So many of the leaders that we see, there was no other black doula training out there. It was, it was under ICTC at that time though I created it. So, so some of the leaves that we see today, they came through our program and now they have their programs. So it is a good effect. It, it is very rewarding. Mm-hmm. And that was my goal, to build capacity in the African-American community. Mm-hmm. And today, if people want to get training from you, it's through the ShafiaMonroe.com website? It is. Okay. One more question I wanted to ask for you. What are your hopes or words of inspiration for any Black birthing families who are listening? Well, I want to say congratulations, first of all, for having a baby. That's one thing that we definitely believe in. So many women never get a congratulations when they're pregnant or a pregnant person does not get a congratulations, especially if they are a black pregnant person, a black pregnant woman, because we're not supposed to really have children, you know, we're not supposed to produce. So definitely giving them a big congratulations. So congratulations if they allow that warm hug. I would say you know, learn, just know that you have the right to have a baby in the best way possible That's that works for you. And that there are people in this country who do want to give you good care. They may be hard to find, but, and then maybe not. So don't give up. Definitely, you know, do go through your network and find out who had a good success experience and find out who they use and make contact with who they use and see if you can get the same service from them as well. You know, use your voice 
you are a paying customer. doesn't matter if it's, you know, if it's so-called, you got Blue Cross Blue Shield, if you're using Obamacare or Medicaid, doesn't matter if you're paying cash. We have to see ourselves as health consumers. We are purchasing a service. No one's giving us anything for free. And so just like we say at the food store, I don't like this tomato. I'm going to go to another store, get my tomato because, and I'm going to complain. This line, this line is too long. I'll never come back. I'm going to tell my friends, don't come to the store because your tomatoes are always bad. I'm going to go across the street and give them my business. We're going to tell this hospital. I'm not going to, I'm going to tell my friends, you know, don't come here. And if you don't treat me right. And also I'm a paying customer and I don't like the service. I want to talk to the person in charge. Where is your, I always start with the president. Like, give me the president of the hospital. Give me the president of human resources. You know, where the, who's the person in charge of complaints so that you can get what your needs met. But, you know, be positive. You know, don't anyone put your light out. Like I said, love yourself, love your unborn, be around positive people. And also I want to tell all women out there, all pregnant people, to abandon the fear. Most births are problem-free. Statistically, you're going to do great. So don't let them make you afraid that your baby's too big or too little or there's too little water. It's always an issue. Don't don't accept that. You know, go into yourself and to kind of think like, you know, do your own pride. How do I really feel that I'm really doing? And you can say, you know what, I hear what you're saying, but I don't really think, I don't feel that. I don't want to be induced. I feel my baby is fine. And most likely your baby is fine. So I can't give medical advice, but I can say believe in yourself. Listen to your inner voice, because that, that is your spiritual voice. The voice has said, you know, don't cross the street. That voice said, no, don't take that job or take that job. The same voice that says, you're going to be okay. I don't really think that's true. And I have mothers say all the time, they said my baby was too small. I didn't believe them. And I came out, my baby wasn't too small. They said my baby's so big and they induced me. My baby weighs seven pounds. So, but they said, I didn't think my baby was too big. They said my baby's so big, I don't have a cesarean section. So if you said that my baby is too big, and you're like, in your mind, my baby's not too big, then stick with your voice because you're carrying that baby. Who knows the baby better than you? You do. So that's my advice. I love it. I just feel like everybody who's listening is just going to be like, feel like they just got a, a hug from Mama Shafia. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Words. Is there anything else you want to share before we go? I would like to share that. I want to make sure that we look at how we are leading the birth move in this country. And I want other cultures to look and see that we all have our own cultures. And it's important because I do teach cultural competence. It's important that as healthcare providers as doulas that we become culturally competent. And I know we're using the term cultural sensitivity and cultural humility and cultural awareness. But the word cultural competency is a word that was designed 50 years ago for people in the medical world. And there's five competencies that they really do make sense. One is to be aware of yourself, which means implicit bias. Well, what are your underlying beliefs about other people that come from how you believe about yourself? And the second is cross-cultural knowledge. How do you get to know about somebody different? And so we have to find ways to go beyond just reading a book and going to a workshop. But if we can diversify our friendships, diversify our colleagues, diversify, you know, where we pray, where we swim, so we can learn. And just taking the training myself, not taking, but teaching the training, I have have grown personally because not because I look at the world different. When someone does something to me that I don't like, before I get angry, I say, think about it, Shafia. It's just actually their culture. Now, I don't like what they do culturally, how they do that, but it is their culture, which means that it wasn't against me. So it just has made me look at people in a very different way. It's been very empowering. And then the third competency is health literacy. You know, be aware that how do you talk to people? And I think with African-Americans, we get the short end of the stick. It's like, I'm going to get a Spanish interpreter. I'm going to get a Somali interpreter. I'm going to get a a Creole interpreter. But for African-Americans, because we speak English, People don't think we need an interpreter, but we do because how we speak English is very different. You know, our language was taken. So we think in our head English for a lot of us differently. So we need to be spoken to in a way that you take your time, break the words down and do that response. Can you tell me what I'm asking you to do? Or can you explain to me what I just said? And can you explain to me how you feel about that? Because sometimes what they'll say is not what you said. It's not what you meant because the way you're speaking the English. So don't use the King James. Don't use a lot of words. I don't want to say a lot because African-Americans are highly intelligent. But again, different groups perceive the information different how we process. And then the other one I think is important is advocacy is the other part for cultural competency. It's important that we advocate for justice in the birth room. And if you advocate for birth justice, you have to advocate for Black Lives Matter. You can't say I'm all about Black women having a good space to birth 
and get in the street and use the N-word and don't want Black people to live next to you and don't think they deserve to have a quality food in their area. So don't just be limited to this birth piece and then it drops there. If you're really real about birth equity, you have to be real about human equity, human rights. It goes everywhere because babies are dying not because of mothers not eating. They're dying because of inequities across the board. Black kids can't get books in their school. They can't get toilet paper, literally. They're going through a prison school. There's cops in the school. They're going through medical detectors where white suburban kids are going through nice schools with a big soccer field, you know, and, and there's no cops standing in the hallway. You know, we have the food deserts. My son, Black, getting arrested for marijuana and a white son getting arrested, two different worlds apart. One gets life or doesn't get bail and all these crazy things. So all of these kind of inequities causes Black pregnant women, Black pregnant people to have un- amounts of daily 24-7 stress. They see it and sometimes they don't even know why they have the stress. You touch their shoulders like a rock. Just every day you walk out their door, what's going to happen? So if you're really about birth justice and physiological birth, all these terms that we use, these birth terms, skin to skin, all this has to go into the everyday world of Black Lives Matter. So I want to end with that. The Black Lives Matter, like you said, it's just, it's all interwoven. It is interwoven, just like birth is, you know, of any race. A mother has to feel loved to have a good birth, has to be in a healthy relationship, has to have good food. It's not just going to prenatal care. We know that's the least important. It's all those things in between. Her preconceptional world, how she can see, where she can see, how she feels about her pregnancy, you know, what kind of support she's getting. Does she feel loved while she's pregnant? As we tell clients, you know, if you didn't see a midwife or a doctor, if you're active, you're eating well and you're happy, statistically, you're going you're to have a fine birth. Prenatal care looks for problems. It doesn't fix things. You know, we, we're look, it's prevention. We're looking for problems. But most moms don't have problems. If you're coming from all the stress, you're going to walk in with problems. And that's where we're seeing this maternal mortality for Black women, which is just like horrific that this is happening, letting Black women die, saying that, you know, we hear these stories of, of Black fathers saying to the nurse, you know, my wife's scared. She's bleeding. We don't have time for her, literally. That's when we, and all the ones we don't know, the, who are the, who heard the exact same thing? Wait, you know, hey, I'm busy, you know, and these women are dying in front of their significant other. It's just so emotional to me even to think about it as we speak. You know, I've known so many women, friends who have lost their friends. I talked to one young woman at a midwife conference that three of her friends died in childbirth last year. And she's like 29. These are friends of her age. These are young women, young girls who are just dying in their lives, who just want to have a baby. Like, why can't Black women have babies too? Why can't we have children? Why can't we live to raise our children like everybody else? And I want to add to um, Rebecca that white women are also dying at a higher rate in this country. And they're dying from actually a higher rate from suicide. And no one's talking about that either. So I think we need to bring that up, that women in this country as a whole are dying. But yes, definitely Black women are having a higher rate of maternal mortality. As we know from the CDC, 60% could be prevented. So we know if 60%, oh my God, that's like, that's huge. That's more than half. So 6% could be prevented and we're not preventing it. That's unbelievable. I don't have words other than something must be done. And I'm glad that we have Black Mama Mads Alliance and other groups out here that are really, you know, bringing to the forefront legislation now that's insisting on um, implicit bias training, legislation that's saying that here's funding that we're going to increase the number of midwives to get them into areas where being underserved. But at the same time, we're losing hospitals. You know, hospitals in Black communities are closing. Women are traveling further, further away. Rural areas, they can't find a doctor. You would think that we want midwives. If you don't want to do as an OB and you don't want to be in that little area and here's a woman that wants to be a licensed midwife, why not support that? You know, why not support that? Yeah, as Jenny Joseph said to me, that this is a generational problem. It will take generations to change. But I feel thankful knowing that you've been working on this and training so many Black doulas and midwives that know the solutions. And I'm thankful that you've been offering so much leadership in this area for so long. Thank you. But we need to let, you know, and I'm glad that I have white women and other races take the train because because black women can't do it by themselves. We live we live in America, you know, we fought for desegregation. So now we're all integrated. We need white doctors and white midwives and Latina midwives and 
age midwives and doctors to know the exact same thing that I'm talking. We all have to have this information and get on the same page. We can't, black people cannot live in a bubble. It's not going to work. You know, uh, it's not a separate world. We're integrated. So we need, We yes, we're glad we have black midwives and black doulas. But as I said on one of my uh, Instagram talks, that it does not take white providers off the hook. They still need to learn cultural competency. They still have to res- res- treat everybody, particularly black women, who are the least respected with respect, with dignity, you know, be polite to their families. Act like it's your sister, your daughter. If you like your mom, act like I'm your mother. You won't let your mother die. Act like I'm your daughter. If you love your daughter, she. You can do everything possible. Don't just me as a black person. See me as your family member and treat me like you would treat them. You would not let me die on the table. So we need to have this racial conversation of how can we, you know, get on the same page. And just treat me. And I, when I, I have seven children, I remember going to the pediatrician and I would ask the doctor about a procedure he wanted to give my child. And I would say, well, are you a dad or a mom? Oh, yes, I am. Would you give this to your child? And one pediatrician, he, he said, well, he kind of hesitated. I said, no, you wouldn't. So I don't want it. So I said, would you do it to your own child? Nope. Okay. Then I don't want it. I don't want it either. So ask those questions. Like, what would you do for your wife, your mother, your husband, your spouse, and and see. But we do need this to be a universal conversation, a national conversation, because we cannot fix this problem by ourselves. And not only that, we didn't cause this problem. I was going to say, it's the root cause is white supremacy. So that's Thank a, you. a white person right. problem, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we didn't cause it, you know? We're victims of it. And we've done amazing as Black people to, to still be as strong, resilient, as wonderful as we are, you know? All that we, the, the trauma is so nonstop and so ongoing. So, definitely, if you're a white provider, when you see your black patient, client, please be extra nice to them, offer them water, you know, just be supportive. If they want to talk to you about something, listen with an open mind. Don't take the fence. Don't say, well, I'm not racist. I like everybody. That's not me. It probably is you because you don't even realize you have implicit bias. Just, just, just be humble and like, okay, and you can journal about how you feel later. Just let them talk and listen and validate. That's the most important thing. I hear what you're saying. I've heard those things happen before. That must be horrible. You know, anything I can do to help or just listen and then go back and try and make some changes. Mm -hmm. So Shafia, I want to let people know how to follow your work. You have your website, shafiamonroe.com, as well as your Instagram, Shafia Monroe. Are there any programs or events coming up or educational resources on your website you want to talk about? I would say I think the most fun thing I'm doing is on my Instagram, Shafi Monroe. I have a series called Black Midwife Cooking, and I do uh, cooking classes, what the Black Midwives did. So I have these amazing soups and stews, recipes and herbs that I talk about, what they mean, how to, how to do them. And so that's a good place to go. If you want to create, you know, the postpartum experience for our clients where we say in our tradition, the African-American tradition of old, that mothers need wet foods because when you have a baby, you lost water, you're sweating, you're urinating, you're crying, you're leaking milk, you're highly get dehydrated. So we we would not want to give a mom a, a hamburger on a bun with a pickle on the side and some fries or some rice and a piece of steak. It's always wet food. So, you know, wet collard greens with coconut and milk and, you know, wet peanut stew with yams and peas or chicken and lamb or goat, whatever you eat. So it's always a wet food. So that's what Black Midwife Cooking is about, bringing back traditional postpartum foods to hydrate moms to keep them healthy and having a good postpartum recuperation. And postpartum is so important because that's when most maternal deaths happen is during that postpartum period. And I saw you have a webinar, continuing education class on your website, all about African-American postpartum care. So I I love that you're doing that Instagram series. That's incredible. So they can, they can actually go to the website, chefima.com, and they can look at some of the webinars that are available on the shop section. And then we're having a physical, hopefully training on cultural competency, but I'm happy to do online cultural competency trainings for people as well, if that's what they need. So and all of our trains are now going online. So our next, we train for 18 years in person. And again, that's tradition. That's our spiritual work, to be in community with people. We did not want to do online training. People would ask, like, no, we're not going to go online. But now, because of COVID, we just got through doing our first online doula training. 
people loved it. I thought it was very, like, very interesting. I, I thought it was very hard to be honest. If I'm used to hugging people and laughing mm-hmm. and animating people and sharing information, it was so different. But people said they loved it, so I'm happy about that. And I'm glad that we're continuing to able to train people. So the next online SMC Full Circle Doula Birth Companion training will be the end of September. So if anyone's interested in learning the traditions of the 20th century African American midwife and cultural competency around Black birth practices. It's just, you know, what public health means in terms of how we get rid of some of this terminology of calling certain people at risk and vulnerable and felony and the WIC mom and the Medicaid mom, all the words I'm against, by the way, as you can see, how we how we dismantle those words and see where they come from. This call instead saying, I have a mother whose insurance is Medicaid. She's not a Medicaid mom. She's a mother who receives Medicaid insurance. And it's funny that we don't say, I don't have, I never say I have a Blue Cross Blue Shield mom only a Medicaid mom. So very interesting how these terms become uh, negative identities without even realizing it. You put that person in a negative uh, category. So the training talks about the terminologies, how to use them, as I said again, the spiritual aspect of birth and midwifery, how to work with midwives. It's just a very historical class. It's much more than becoming a dual. It's really becoming, uh, it's an awakening on Black history around Mm -hmm. birth practices and empowerment. Like the name, it's coming full circle. Thank you. And it looks like you have fall and winter trainings. (laughs) Yeah. So definitely check out shafiamonroe.com. There's just a wealth of information and resources there. Thank you so much, Shafia, for coming on and educating our listeners. Thank you, Rebecca, for having me. And please keep up the good work. As I mentioned earlier, when you do evidence-based work, I can find information and I can put it in something we know historic has always helped. So it's nice to know that we can find science to prove what the grandmoms knew long ago. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Today's podcast was brought to you by the Evidence-Based Birth Professional Membership. The free articles and podcasts we provide to the public are supported by our professional membership program at Evidence-Based Birth. Our members are professionals in the childbirth field who are committed to being change agents in their community. Professional members at EBV get access to continuing education courses with up to 23 contact hours, live monthly training sessions, an exclusive library of printer-friendly PDFs to share with your clients, and a supportive community for asking questions and sharing challenges, struggles, and success stories. We offer monthly and annual plans, as well as scholarships for students and for people of color. To learn more, visit ebbirth.com membership.